Good afternoon, everybody. Today we have with us um, Ela Dr. Elana Fertig. She runs a, a mixed wet and dry lab at, at Johns Hopkins University at the Sydney, at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer, Comprehensive Cancer Center. And she's also an associate professor of oncology, assistant director of, research, of the research program in quantitative sciences at the Johns Hopkins University. And she was even a NASA research fellow in numerical weather prediction. So today she's going to talk to us about identifying therapeutic yeah. resistance mechanisms in cancer with single cell data and machine learning. And this is a seminar that I really look forward to, to, to it. And I'd leave the stage to you, Elena. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Eduardo, and for everybody for having me here. It's really an honor. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk um, a little bit about how I think about therapeutic response and resistance in cancer. Um, I think this is informed from my days in weather prediction to some extent of thinking about nonlinear dynamic systems and how systems evolve over time. And so a lot of the work I feel like that's going into precision medicine and cancer at large is focused largely on pre-treatment snapshots of tumors and trying to figure out what the molecular and cellular landscape of those tumors is from those data and use that for therapeutic selection. And I think what a lot of people can appreciate in terms of the types of responses that we observe in patients and the complexity of tumors is that's really a daunting challenge. And it doesn't really consider the full um, biology of tumors where these are systems that evolve over time so for example, initially uh, tumors that are largely sensitive, if you look at cancer cell populations that are initially sensitive to a drug, they'll derive resistance. It's gonna depend on the cellular composition of those tumors. What is the immune landscape and the microenvironment at large? And not only what cells are there, but also what's the relative spatial distribution? How are they interacting with one another? And so it's this multi-scale temporal process that's really driving the types of therapeutic responses that we see in patients. And it's critical that we start to understand those. And what's been fortunate is that the technologies that we have today and as they've been developing have really enabled us to tease apart these different features <coughs> of tumors um, in order to study what's going on in therapeutic response and resistance. And so I'm gonna go through today a number of different systems of how we study this with the framework of one common machine learning framework to understand them and how it can be applied in different contexts. So to start with, with therapeutic resistance. So I'm gonna focus in the context of targeted therapies. So what are these? These are molecular inhibitors. And the idea is that if you have a population of cancer cells, that have one predominant alteration <coughs> in the molecular state <coughs> as shown in the blue cells. And you hit them with a drug that blocks that, that um, pathway, then ideally those cells should die off and you'll reduce the shrinkage, of, you'll reduce the tumor burden. Unfortunately, what was observed is that most patients ultimately develop resistance to these therapies because what happens is that there's a small population of cells that are initially have other molecular mechanisms that are intrinsically resistant to these therapies, which can then outgrow when you get rid of the dominant population, as well as tumors are evolving. And so you get these secondary resistance mechanisms that come up and also alter the tumor. <coughs> so the question is, what are these? So in some cases, I'm gonna focus in the case of anti-EGFR resistance. So EGFR is one of these pathways that's commonly targeted in therapy in, as a therapy. And it's used in different types of cancer, both colorectal and head and neck have a large burden of EGFR alterations that lead it to be FDA approved and, uh, and used in those cancer types. In colorectal cancer, the mutational landscape so that's associated with resistance is very well known. So you can have other mutations in BRAF and RAS as your intrinsic resistance mechanisms, and then additional mutations or um, amplifications have been very well characterized <clears throat> as the tumor involves. 
In head and neck cancer, this has not been the case. There hasn't been this sort of predominant of clear cut mutational progression associated with resistance. So the question is what's going on, right? What are the other changes that are occurring? So we hypothesize that you can't really study the system statically, that you really do need to take a dynamic approach to understanding this. <clears throat> so in order to do this, what we did is we took a head and neck cancer cell line, SCC25, that was de novo sensitive to therapy and treated it with drug for a period of 12 weeks until it developed resistance. And what we did is that, every, and we had control cells that we also treated for the same period of 12 weeks with no, no treatment, right, just PBS. And what we did is we developed an experimental protocol, this was before single cell days, so for both technologies, that would enable us to measure the cells every single week as therapy was, was developing. So that way we could collect gene expression, DNA methylation, and other multiomics assays to figure out what was going on. <clears throat> when we got the gene expression changer, gene expression data, what we were hoping to see was smooth transitions associated with the resistance so we could pinpoint the mechanism. And what we immediately observed when we went to a clustering analysis of the data is that the predominant change that we see is just due to the fact that you treated these cells and really doesn't have much to do with the acquisition of resistance. So the question becomes, how can you go deeper into these data to figure out what are the unknown drivers of resistance that are occurring in your system? And so we're fortunate that pattern detection algorithms for high throughput data are really very mature in the mathematical community in terms of how we look at data. And matrix factorization in particular is one robust tool for looking at these data sets. So I'm gonna sort of take a pause away from the world of cetuximab resistance in head and neck and now enter this little cartoon world. And in this case, <clears throat> My whole world has only four genes that I've drawn on the left. And the y-axis represents the relative expression and the x-axis represents each sample. And you can imagine, for example, the first set of group is maybe treated and the second set is untreated. <coughs> and what you can clearly see by eye, if you look at this data, is that there's two dominant patterns in the data. One going up and down in the first set of samples and one going up and down in the second set of samples. And the idea of matrix factorization is that you just represent all your data in terms of what those patterns are and how much each gene uses each one. And so the trick of this, there's several algorithms for this, right? There's PCA, independent component analysis, non-negative matrix factorization. There's several different features for this. And they'll all give you different viewpoints into the data. My group in particular has focused a lot on non-negative matrix factorization, because as is shown in this picture, that's the one that uniquely gives this additive signal where you can sort of see what the different features are that make up the biological system and how they fit together. <clears throat> and in particular, we developed a Bayesian sparse non-negative matrix factorization data and the idea is that the prior in this system explicitly models the sparsity of biological data. So you get this additive component where you're able to add them up, but you also get this sparsity. And what we found is that the Bayesian model in our system also leads to more robust solutions than has been observed with gradient-based solutions. So it gives us a little bit more of a stable representation of the data. So now when we go back to our data for this gene, for the resistance, we're going to apply this matrix factorization approach to see, can we learn additional patterns that are associated with the resistance? And I'm going to imagine now I'm going to this just plot that I show for the pattern matrix. <clears throat> and indeed, what we observe is three dominant patterns in the data. One that's relatively constant, higher in treatment, and that's consistent with what we observe in the clustering, where you get the separation of treatment versus not. But the other two are now new features where we get the slow increase with, with expression with resistance and this decreased expression with resistance. 
So now we're able to start teasing apart what are the dynamic changes in our cells that are actually related to the phenotype as opposed to just presence of the treatment. <coughs> so then my biology colleagues always come back to me they're like, well, Anna, that's really great that you drew these patterns, but I have no clue what to target now. You haven't given me any biology here. What did you actually find? So I'm excited because I found the patterns of the data, but we need to go a little bit deeper. So what my postdoc Genevieve realized is that a lot of times when we look at these types of models, what we tend to focus on is which gene is most highly associated with one feature versus another. And if you go back to my cartoon example, what would that give you? Let's say you wanted to focus on the second pattern. Well, that would give you that the fourth gene is most relevant. But really, the fourth gene is using both patterns. It just happens to be using the other one twice as much. And what you might really care about if you want to develop biomarkers to get a clean picture of the data is not which genes are most highly expressed, but which genes are most uniquely expressed in one feature versus another. And so she developed a pattern marker statistic, we call it, to identify genes that are most uniquely associated with a pattern. <clears throat> and when we apply that to our data, we're now able to observe these very smooth transitions that we see sort of as line graphs of the patterns, but directly relate them back to genes in the system to visualize them on a heat map and start relating them to biology. And we went on in this study, I'm not going to go in through all the details, but we went on to do this for DNA methylation as well. And what we found is that there was compensatory growth factor signaling through FGFR that was associated with resistance as the driving mechanism in this study. So <clears throat> the next question becomes, okay, so we see this arise. Is this a slow growing subclone from an intrinsic resistance mechanism or is this something that really was acquired in the population over time? <coughs> and, and, you know, this sort of um, FGFR re-expression is one type of mechanism that's been associated with therapeutic resistance, but it's not the only one. And so if I look at the dominant features that have been associated with resistance, there's this compensatory growth factor receptor that I showed you for FGFR, we had in a previous study linked that to a central transcription factor, TFAP2, that actually regulates a whole family of growth factor receptors, as well as epithelial to mesenchymal transition has been observed in other studies. So the question we had is, how much of, are each of these features intrinsic, really resist, arising with intrinsic resistance, and how heterogeneous are they within a population? Are they co-occurring? Are they mutually exclusive? What's going on? So in order to do this, we went back to the same SCC25 cell line, as well as two others, um, SCC1 and SCC6, that were all de novo sensitive to um, cetuximab and had treated and untreated cells. <clears throat> and now, thanks to single cell technologies, we're actually able to look at the molecular heterogeneity of these cellular populations, um, you know, pre-treatment to see what the features are. And when we look at early treatment, right, so this is treatment, at, this is just six days of treatment as opposed to the 12 weeks that I showed you in the previous, fig in the previous results, what we observe is that these, these mechanisms that we associated with resistance, either overexpression of TFAP2 or EMT through overexpression of vimentin, are indeed present in the pretreatment cell lines. And they're not even necessarily enhanced by treatment. So for example, in SCC1, we observe this TFAP2 alpha overexpression in both treatment and untreated, suggesting that you have this compensatory growth factor that's there as, um, as sort of within the pretreatment population that then would be selected through clonal outgrowth. And in other cell lines, you observe other molecular mechanisms that are dominating. And some of them have both TFAP2 and vimentin, and some of them, they're mutually exclusive. So you can see that these, a lot of these mechanisms are hardwired into the cells, and it's very heterogeneous across the cancer cells, which ones of these that they're gonna be using. 
So this gives one landscape into the types of tumor cell resistance that's seen to therapy. The challenge is that if we look at therapeutic response and resistance, it's not only a tumor cell phenomenon. So it's very easy to say canonically, this drug blocks the EGFR pathway and that's its dominant mechanism of action. And that's how cancer cells develop therapeutic response or resistance. In reality, cancer cells are never in isolation. They're in these microenvironments with a whole lot of other cells in them. And the immune cells can also mediate therapeutic response. And one way this can happen is through ADCC with the interaction of natural killer cells, where what happens is the antibody recognizes the EGFR expression, binds, and then that causes NK cells to come in and kill off that cell. <coughs> and so the mechanism of action, <coughs> excuse me, is not actually from EGFR inhibition alone. It's from both EGFR inhibition, but also immune attack. <clears throat> and so what my colleague Lou Wiener did is he wanted to understand what are the mechanisms of immune evasion that result from this type of system when you get resistance, not through blocking the EGFR pathway, but with using this drug through NK cell killing. And so he repeated the same type of experimental design that we did for our time course data for understanding therapeutic resistance, but now in the presence of co-culture with NK cells. We're able to get, when we get the time course gene expression data, we're able to apply our same COGAPS analysis and now take the genes that are forming as pattern markers and put them into the string database for network regulation so that we're, we're able to map them onto molecular changes and how they interact. And when we do that in this system, what we observed <coughs> was histone gene modules associated with epigenetic regulation, regulating a module of interferon gamma genes. So it seems that epigenetic changes are regulating interferon gamma associated with the resistance in the system. And again, we wanted to ask the same question. Is this pre-existing or is this something that's developed? And so we're going to go to single cell. And what we expect to see is that the sensitive cells start looking like the resistant population. Or the subset of the sensitive cells look like the resistant suggestive with a clone. What we observe is exactly the opposite. We observe that a subset of the resistant cells look like the sensitive, suggesting in that you know, a portion of the cells might still be you know, sensitive to the drug rather than any sort of clonal outgrowth. So we weren't sure if this was a feature of looking at the overall data, right? Of like what's going on by looking at this globally through a UMAP style analysis. And what would happen if we look at, well, just the genes that are associated with that epigenetic regulation of the histone of um, interferon gamma? <clears throat> so the idea that we've had is that we're learning these features through our matrix factorization of gene signatures, right? And we can think of each of these features, each of these patterns that we're learning in the data as the lenses through which we view it. So you get a, a signature of gene weights, and now you get a new data set. You can rewrite that data set as a linear combination of the gene weights that you observed in a previous study. And so the idea is that you get these lenses and you basically are shining the new data set that you get through them by projecting it onto them. And so we developed a transfer learning package called Project R that lets us do this in the context of non-negative matrix factorization, but it's also generalizable to other methodologies um, if it's of interest. <clears throat> and so now we're going to apply it here to our data set where the idea is now we have these signatures that we learned from bulk RNA-C that are associated with resistance and we wanna query for them in the single cell data. And when we apply this to our data set, what we observe is that the same signature that's associated with the resistance in bulk, we can see it increasing as we go from sensitive to resistant. And we can now start to discern a subset of cells in the sensitive population that are enhanced for our resistance signature. <clears throat> 
So we can see indeed that it does appear to be pre-existing subclone that's hidden from standard analyses. <coughs> and we aren't just limited to going, you know, from one, the same model to itself. So Dr. Wiener's lab more recently has generated um, single cell data um, of resistance where they've looked at this NK cell killing in other cell lines with other therapies. And we observe that this resistance signature to NK killing is robust across three different models now using our projection method. So that brings us through sort of, you know, the, um, sorry, through targeted therapies and their interaction with the immune system. But the more obvious case where we really care about um, what's going on in the immune system is immune checkpoint inhibitors, which really have revolutionized cancer treatment recently. <coughs> and there's this idea, right, that immunotherapy responsive tumors are going to be these tumors where you have a lot of T cells that are, that are near the tumor that are able to infiltrate it. And they're able to recognize the antigens presented on that tumor. So these are the immunotherapy responsive or immune hot tumors. And the idea is when you give an immune checkpoint, it just reactivates the T cells so they're able to work. On the other hand, immune cold tumors are tumors that are invaded with a lot of immunosuppressive cells. So they're blocking off the T cell killing. And these are so-called immune cold tumors. And there's a lot of goal now to understand what are the molecular mechanisms behind immunotherapy responsive and immune cold with the idea that can you use combination therapies to target the immunosuppressive mechanisms in immune cold tumors in order to make them immune hot. <coughs> and again, so I focused on single cell technologies before in the context of tumor cell heterogeneity. But they also really do enable us to capture the cellular composition of tumor samples, right? So from a single cell data, when you perform clustering, you're able to get out these different axes of their, these different cell types through clustering style methods. But single cell data isn't only cell type, right? I think a lot of times the analyses kind of start and end there. You do a clustering, you, you know, and you figure out what the cell types are. But I would argue like, why do single cell then? Why not do multi-parameter flow and you know, save yourself a bunch of time and money? Um, and the advantage of single cell data, <coughs> excuse me, is that they have these signatures in them of the whole transcriptional profile, which yes, gives you cell type, but it also gives you what's the phenotype? Where is it sort of along the evolutionary history of a cell? Where is it in cell cycle and even spatial position all give signatures that are gonna impact the transcriptional profile that you've observed. And this idea of having multiple features in the data that are on distinct like sort of transcriptional signatures, well, that's nothing new than the matrix factorization that I presented for bulk data. So it's the same concept, like whereas in bulk data, we were sort of trying to tease it apart. Now in single cell data, we're trying to use the same concept of matrix factorization to pull the data back together and figure out what the different signatures are. <coughs> so as an example of this, <clears throat> what we did is take single cell data of immune cells in a preclinical sarcoma model from a public data set that was generated by Gubin et al, where they took a mouse model, had control anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4 in the combo. And in their original paper, they did sort of the standard clustering analysis of this data where they observed the canonical cell types and then went forward to characterize how that related to therapy. We wanted to see, can we go a little bit deeper through matrix factorization? And when we do, we observe several patterns in the data, but one of them notably, we observed this heterogeneity within the NK cell population. <clears throat> And when we looked at which cells that came from in the overall system, we found that it was uniquely overexpressed in the anti-CTLA-4 treated model. And so the question is what's going on in anti-CTLA-4 treatment in these NK cells? So in order to do that, we observed that this pattern was enhanced over pseudotime 
And when we look at the genes that are associated with it, they're genes that are associated with activation of NK cells. So again, you know, the question is, is this, <coughs> you know, this is cool, but is this just one feature in this mouse model? How universal is it? How meaningful is it, right? <coughs> so the same transfer learning approach that I showed <coughs> that lets you go from bulk to single cell, we can apply that same approach to go from mouse to human and see how much is what we're seeing in the mouse model related to what we're seeing in the human data. And so in this preprint, we, we Emily looked at several different data sets to see how robust is this NK cell pattern in the types of treatment responses that we see in patients. And notably, what she did is take this pattern and look at it in metastatic melanoma. And what we see is when we project from the mouse to the human, we're able to separate out the cells between non-responders and responders uniquely in the anti-CTLA-4 group. And so <clears throat> we went on further to say, <clears throat> you know, what is it about the NK cells that they're seeing this response really uniquely to anti-CTLA-4? So what Allison Fitzgerald did in Lou Wiener's lab was go back and look at both human NK cell lines and human donor NK cells and look at CTLA-4 expression and observed that both at an RNA level and protein level, these cells, these NK cells, indeed do express CTLA-4. And then conjugating a fluorophore to ipilimumab, what we also observed is that they were uniquely expressed on the surface of NK cells. So we're seeing that CTLA-4 is expressed on the surface of, of, C, of NK cells, and we think that anti-CTLA-4 response may also be activating the NK cell mechanisms of killing independent of ADCC, really through a more direct mechanism, but more functional work is needed in order to validate that. <clears throat> but what that does show is that this sort of pipeline from matrix factorization through transfer learning enables us to start thinking about how can we go from preclinical and clinical models in order to start saying we're going to evaluate something in preclinical and then look at it in human in order to figure out what's going on there and what are the next set of experiments that we're doing so we can start to think back and forth with a bench to bedside technique. The other thing about transfer learning is that it doesn't only enable cross species analysis, it's really robust for data integration overall. So as I showed you before, it can go between single cell and RNA-seq. It can also go between single cell RNA and single cell ATAC, single cell RNA-seq and imaging. It's really a very robust method for going across technologies and evaluating what's going on to start looking at data in new ways and new regulatory mechanisms. <coughs> so again, this is sort of giving us a sense of what's going on in all of these model systems. But the, you know, the million dollar question is what's going on in patients, right, as they respond to therapy and how is this related to clinical trials? So in a newer study in a collaboration with Liz Jaffe and Lei Zhang, what we've done is they've collected single cell RNA sequencing data of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in a neoadjuvant clinical trial of pancreatic cancer. And this trial has three different arms, uh, side GVAX, which is a vaccine strategy, side GVAX and nivolumab, which is an immune checkpoint, side GVAX, nivolumab, and nirolumab, where you add this third agent with the idea, again, of combating the immunosuppressive cells. <coughs> And we can do the sort of canonical type of clustering analysis, CB cells, CD8 T cells, NK cells, CD4, TAMs, you know, we can get the canonical cell types and look at their distribution by trial arms. But again, we want to go a little bit deeper into the T cells and see what's going on, right? Like not just what are their abundances, but what are their states and how is that related to their expansion um, in activation? So if we do clustering, <coughs> what we're able to see is this sort of, we're able to subtype the CD8 T cells, 
and observe a transition that's associated with changes in canonical exhaustion markers. So we see this increase of what appears to be T cell exhaustion that changes with the trial arm. So in the initial treatment, we, do, you know, we see sort of all classical CD8 T cells. And then as we go to trial arm C with this combination, we observe more cells in the CD8 granzyme B PD1 positive. So it appears to be more T cells that have been exhausted. And if we look at the corresponding TCR states for a T cell expansion of specific clones, <coughs> What we observe is a clonal expansion in RMC. So this would lead us to the hypothesis that we see T cell clonal expansion in the combination therapy with exhausted T cells, suggesting that the therapy has worked, but has sort of hit its wall. So the question is, is it exhaustion or can we go a little bit deeper into these data to see what are the other molecular features that are associated with it than just the gross cluster markers? So not surprising, we're going to apply COGAPS to this because I'm giving this talk. Um, <clears throat> and what we observe is that the COGAPS pattern weights were able to find a, mat a pattern that perfectly mirrors this, this um, pseudo time transition <clears throat> and the different exhaustion states of these clusters. <clears throat> when we actually look at the patterns that are the genes that are associated with it then by having these gene signatures from COGAPS, what we see is a mixture of genes that are associated with exhaustion and activation, suggesting that there might be some new T cell reactivation actually going on in this system and that it's not just pure exhaustion. So we're working on quantifying that a little bit now in the group to see how can we get sort of T's apart, which subsets of T cells are reactivated and which ones are exhausted to see if it's co-expressing these markers or their different cells. And that's some of what we're working on now. <clears throat> so again, this is giving us the immune landscape, but it's not just a question of what cells are there, right? It's where they are spatially, right? Because I could have T cells, but if they're not near the tumor, it's completely irrelevant. And even this year, you know, in 2020, the method of the year, according to Nature Methods, was named uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics. And so we're really fortunate that now we're able to start actually deriving on slides, what are the transcriptional signatures that are occurring along the sort of, along the architecture of a tumor. <clears throat> and spatial molecular technologies are really the cutting edge of single cell, right? So you have spatial proteomics where you have um, a lot of different technologies for this. These tend to be higher cellular resolution and lower molecular re resolution. And they often rely on antibodies that are pre-selected for specific cell types or function. <coughs> on the other hand, you have spatial transcriptomics technologies, which again, you have this trade-off between cellular and molecular resolution. You have the fish-based technologies that like their proteomics counterparts rely on pre-selection of, your, of your, um, your gene targets. But there's also new technologies like SlideSeq and Visium that are really advancing toward whole transcriptome cell level profiling, but you have a trade-off that you don't get the tight cellular resolution that you get with the fish-based technologies or, or spatial proteomics. <clears throat> so in collaboration with 10X Genomics, we got a sample um, Visium data set of um, an invasive ductal carcinoma tumor. And with the Visium technology, what you can see is it provides H&E and also gene expression at a whole transcriptome level. It's not quite a cellular resolution. You can see on the right where I've plotted CD8A as a marker of T cells, that it's in these little spots, right? But these spots are the resolution of about one to 10 cells and they're across the whole slide. <clears throat> so in this data set, What's interesting about this one is that it's got both invasive carcinoma as well as several invasive lesions that were annotated. The circles here are drawn by a pathologist, right? <clears throat> and on the right, I've just looked at CD8 expression. And you can see that it maps what they've indicated as being the immune cell regions. 
So again, we're gonna to go to COGAPS to see, can we tease apart the molecular signatures of this more deeply in order to interrogate what are the molecular features of, the <clears throat> of these tumors? When we apply this to the data, what we observe um, is that we were kind of excited about is that we're able to segregate out the invasive carcinoma from the DCIS lesions. And we're able to find some features that span all of the DCIS lesions, while others are really unique to one lesion or another. And from the biology side, what's really scary about this when we look back on the molecular pathways that we see is that if we look at each of these lesions, they each use a different hormone receptor signaling pathway. And so if we think about canonical targeted therapeutics, where we would make a therapeutic selection based on one dominant signaling pathway, right? So for example, in this case, probably typically it would be based on the invasive carcinoma and lead somebody to conclude that they should use a VEGF or FGFR inhibitor. What you're gonna see is that because you have insulin receptor, androgen receptor and estrogen receptor expressed heterogeneously in the different lesions, those are gonna be features that could very easily pop up in this sort of model of intrinsic resistance. <clears throat> and again, we wanna understand not only what's going on in the tumor cells, but what's exciting about this is that we can start to look also at the interactions and interface with the immune cells. And so now we have this immune, we see not only these invasive carcinoma patterns, but we also start to observe in this data other patterns that are associated with immune cells. So we can start to overlay these and now look at the interactions between the immune and tumor cells. And again, that's where some of our current work in the group is going. So I hope today I've sort of talked about the different ways that therapeutic response and resistance really are multi-scale processes over time and cell composition um, that are dependent on the spatial de uh, resolution of um, tumors. And that we really do need time course multiomic study designs in order to start understanding these. Um, I think single cell technologies are really exciting for the biology of this, for actually being able to uncover it. Um, and matrix factorization and transfer learning are really robust approaches for this. So with that, I'd like to thank the members of my lab and my collaborators and funders. And thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. So oh, thank you very much, Elana. That was an amazing talk. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the the you know all the single cell work and the final touch with the spatial and and, and all of that. Uh, I have a lot of questions about the biology. Uh, uh, let me remind the, um, the other people that they I think that they can ask questions through the chat. And Alba, I think is going to be our moderator for the questions. Yes. Okay. So I have uh, one to begin with. One simple technical question. So COGAPS, you, sh you showed that in bulk it, it works super well. Okay. Mm -hmm. But single cell tends to be much more noisy, right? And and tends to have much more batch effects. And and you know you have dropouts and and you you don't have the expression of the entire of, of the whole transcriptome. So how does that affect the, the, your comparisons between bulk and single cell? And, and, and you, you seem to have shown that, that the results don't change much, but do you have any yeah. other insights about that? It seems to work really well. Um, and we actually think it's pretty robust to batch effects um, in the data. So that was um, in our original publication. What we did is we, so when we first sort of used transfer learning we applied it in the context of developing the developing mouse retina because it's a much more robust system where the cell types are much more well known. And what we showed is that in that approach, you're able to um, project into systems, even if they're from different labs and different experimental designs and really correct for batch. Um, and what we found is that the some of the patterns that you learn, if you have a data set that's batchy, some of the patterns that you learn are associated with batch and some of them are associated with the biology. 
and we found that the batch patterns don't project into a new data set, but the biological ones appear to be robust. And I think what's going on is that as long, <clears throat> even though you have dropout, I think the structure of gene correlations that you learn from matrix factorization are still robust. And so it's able to project uh, you know, pretty well. We haven't done a systematic evaluation. There's probably room for this of like, what's the percentage of dropout that is, you know, able to, you know, be accounted for or not. Um, and we did another study that we haven't written up from the lab, but we probably need to write it up where we looked at this across technologies. And we saw that um, the matrix factorization approach didn't work if you applied the factorization across technologies really well that batch effects were too too big. So you might need to do a separate analysis within technology, but probably that there might be ways to optimize that. But we definitely, it's, it's definitely a tricky area of what's, we have an argument in the lab about whether we should apply it within one batch and then project or apply it at higher dimension across batches. Um, and so I think it might be data set dependent too. Thank you. Uh, Alba, I think I saw some yeah, questions. There's a question. There's a question from Alexis in the chat. Uh, I'm sure maybe Alexis, you want to unmute yourself and comment directly. Yes. Uh, so f first, uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. And I was uh, wondering uh, what like the difference in terms of statistics, like the mathematical background. Uh, between uh, uh, COGAP and other mutuomics uh, integration methods like uh, MOFA and uh, LIGER? <laughs> yeah, so I'll start, I'll focus most on LIGER because I'm most familiar with that one. Um, LIGER is a coupled matrix factorization, right? So it relies on um, cells. It relies on sort of you put them together and either it's by genes or by cells, right? So you end up with a larger data matrix and then you're applying matrix factorization to that, um, a non-negative matrix factorization model. Our underlying model for COGAPS is a little bit different than LIGER um, in that we have this Bayesian framework um, with the, the model that I showed that models uh, sparsity. Uh, the effect of that is that it's slower to run, but the sort of side benefit of that is that it's um, more, fit, it's, we found that it's more robust um, when you run it. <clears throat> but let's let's ignore sort of the minor differences between the underlying math of the algorithm and like focus on the conceptual of do you combine the two data sets into one metadata set and do an integrated analysis, or do you do the factorization in one and then project into another? Um, so in our in bulk, we had actually done a coupled matrix factorization years ago um, to look at head and neck cancer subtypes between um, methylation and expression. And in the time course data that I showed you, we tried to apply it there. And we found that the method completely didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is when we looked at the data, the patterns that we observed in DNA methylation were offset from the ones that we observed in gene expression. They were offset in time. So you had the methylation changes occurring after the expression changes. So when you tried to combine them into like one big data set, you weren't able to find a robust pattern because they were different between the data modalities. And so because of that, that's part of why we moved and developed the transfer learning approach was the idea that maybe you would fully explore one data set and then look at their inner relationship. Um, there's probably approaches to get at that, um, but I think it's, it's a pro and a con. You know, there's other approaches like canonical correlation analysis also that I think, you know, are really robust. And I think those probably do a good job of correcting things onto a common coordinate axis. But there, I think you lose some of the interpretability of the gene signatures. So I think this is really um, an open question in the field of what's the right model. And my guess is it probably depends on the question that you're asking rather than there being one right solution. Hmm, okay, yeah. very interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Lana, so there's a question from David Chirilo. Hi, hi Lana. Uh, thank you for the really nice presentation. So I have two questions actually. The, the first one is about uh, transfer learning. Uh, as far as I know, this is generally used when you have uh, to transfer information from a subtor domain to a target domain. No? When you have a lot of information in one domain and like few information in the other. So this is why you are applying this, uh, this technique. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, but, but in, in the cases, like in the data sets that you show, like you already have a lot of information also in the, in the target. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know what is the, the real advantage of using a transfer learning approach instead of just modeling the, the thing that you have to model? Because it lets you define the interactions between them, right? So I agree with you, you might not necessarily need it, but it lets you, like in the case of like, sing, of um, for example, sing, bulk to single cell, right? Mm -hmm. It let us look at, is that specific molecular feature pre-existing, right? Which I think we wouldn't have gotten through just looking at the data set itself. I think we would have, um, I, I think we would have um, been washed out and probably found another signal or not even found the pre-existing resistance signal because it's such a rare subpopulation, hmm. right? So I think, I think we would have lost it. You're right, maybe we could have found it because we know the biology. Um, there's also the integration, right? So like you could use it to look at, for example, transcriptional regulation, because if you look at it with epigenetics, then you can see, are they all occurring? So you might be able to find the same features without it. I don't know. Um, it's certainly possible if you do the analysis right and independently. But I think it lets you look at interrelationships between data sets that you might lose otherwise. <clears throat> and, and the second question is about uh, go gaps and uh, the patterns that you're finding in uh, the bulk RNA seq. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I, I was a bit surprised that they are just like four or five. So I was wondering whether, like, it's kind of, uh, you know, if it's kind of like bias, put in quotes, towards. Uh, extreme behaviors of genes and and what happens to the more subtle changes let's say i think that's fair it definitely is biased <clears throat> towards the more extreme um you know the data set i had right we only had 24 samples so it, it's you know for a time course experiment you know that's crazy a crazy number right yeah. but it's still really small so we're always going to be limited by the number of samples we've had mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we've seen that's interesting that I think um, is coming out and being borne out in the literature by others now too, is that um, the factorizations are really sensitive to the number of features that you use. And so what we've seen is if you apply it at lower dimensions, you see one sort of dominant set. And then as you go to higher and higher dimensions, you tease out more subtle approaches. Yeah. And with COGAPs in particular, what we've seen is that because the patterns are robust, um, we see that they split. And so you'll see one robust feature that then will split into two others. And so that will give you sort of a hierarchy of the data. Um, and we've seen that occur in, um, for example, cancer subtypes when we've applied it, where like if you applied at low dimensions, you see tumor versus normal. And then at higher dimension, it splits apart the tumor subtypes. Um, so we've published on that. You can see the same thing in immune cells, but we haven't actually published that yet. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. So Victoria has also a question for you. Victoria, go on. Yes. Um, thank you, Elena. So I wanted to ask you um, about co-gaps. Um, if you have uh, try your method with other type of biological data or even non-biological, which uh, could follow this type of additive signals, I'm curious. So yeah. certainly in other biological systems, we've, we've you know, tried it a lot in developmental biology. Um, and then my colleagues have tried it also in neuroscience and it's been very effective there outside the cancer context. Um, I personally have not tried it outside the context of genomics, but um, my, uh, my mentor, Mike Oaks, um, has. So he actually originally developed the data looking at fMRI or the algorithm, like sort of the precursor to the COGAPS algorithm, this Bayesian non-negative matrix factorization. 
he applied an fMRI. Um, and then looking at images of like animal striping patterns, um, and it's robust in that too. So um, I think it's like a generic, I think anywhere that non-negative matrix factorization works, this works. It's just the Bayesian model and the sparsity gives it a little bit more robustness at the trade-off of greater computational cost. So, you know, it, it's one of those, you can't have everything, but. <laughs> okay, thanks. I don't see any further questions on the chat. I'm not sure if anyone else has one. Yeah. Yes, Vera, go on. Yeah. Hi, Elena. It's really nice to see you and wonderful work. Seriously impressive. Um, I'm curious to know about your expertise with the spatial transcriptomics. So what is your feel about the, the different types of uh, technologies that we have? There's really a gap between either being perfectly single cell resolved, but very limited in the, in the number of genes. And then on the other side, you have almost genome wide, but then you don't have the single cell. So what is your feeling in terms of immune oncology? Can we really cope with the fact that we have to still do the convolution when we have a spot? So my feeling is that it, it's, it's a great question and it's one that we're arguing a lot. <laughs> Um, you know, and especially the immunologists in my group are like, you know, Visium is, they're like, why are you bought? Like, they're like, this is expensive and you're not getting single cell resolution. Um, so I do think it depends on what you want to do. So I think for immune cells, like if, if you really care about immune cell composition, I think the spatial proteomics methods are more robust and better um, for that. I would argue that the same might be true for cytop versus single cell RNA. I might argue if like you really care about characterizing immune cells, you might be better off using cytop, right? For the same reasons. I think you're gonna get more robust characterization of immune cells. Hmm. I think um, where Visium gives you something that, um, that you don't get out of that is um, in understanding the tumor cells, right? And so the the, the distribution of the tumor cell regions that I showed, there's no way you would have gotten that from, you know, imaging mass cytometry, right? Like there's just, I mean, I guess you could if you knew exactly which markers to go for, but I think that would be much harder. And yeah. so I think, I think there's a tendency of people in the targeted therapy world to ignore the immune system and the fan of a tumor immunologist to ignore the tumor cells. And I think that there's a role for both of these in understanding therapeutic response. Yeah. So I think that the technology really, I, I think you might need both. Um, I, I think you might not be able to do one or the other. I think you might need both the imaging mass cytometry and the Visium in order to get at those interactions. Mm -hmm. It's also a matter of uh, the, the size of the era you can look at, right? Um, yeah. When you're considering Hyperion, it's, it's great, but it's very, very limited. So you showed pancreatic cancer. It's so heterogeneous that you miss 70% uh, of the story. So, yes. Um, yeah, I think it's a problem. But do you think that Visium will actually get to single cell? Because they, they keep advertising that. And that would really solve most problems, right? I don't know if Visium, like I'm sure they're gonna come up with some solution. You know, the question is whether Visium is gonna to get to single cell before fish technologies become commercial, right? right. So I, I think there might be a race right. between that. Um, Let, let's watch what's happening. Uh, it's, it's gonna be interesting to get the first data set around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is probably me as a mathematician, right? Like I'm like, to me, I kind of feel partially agnostic and I feel like I should just assume that we're going to have the multiomics level at single cell resolution because we know some technology is going to solve that, right? And we know it's going to be relatively fast. Yeah. So I, I'm sort of comfortable with saying like, okay, that technology will exist pretty soon. Let me start thinking about how I'm going to model the biology when it exists rather than worrying about, you know, chasing one versus another. But meanwhile, I'll use what I can, you know, I'll use what I can get commercially um, to get those up and see what the limits of that are, but. Right, yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, Eduard, maybe your last question, because it's uh, two minutes to oh. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to wait in a little bit on that. So they promised, 10X promised a 400 times higher resolution plat vision platform mm -hmm. by the end of 2021, I think, or first half of 2022. And I think BGI, they just uploaded this bioarchive paper with, with even subcellular yeah. spatial transcriptomics resolution. So when that becomes commercially available, that's going to be amazing. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, so in the meantime, since we have what we have, what do you think about in, you know having from the same sample to, to, to save a bit, to do single cell, and save another bit to do spatial, and then merge both? That's what do we're doing. Do you think that improves the resolution from Bizum alone? I'll tell you when, I mean, we just got the data, so I okay. can't answer that, but I can't see why it wouldn't. Okay. But yeah, that's sort of our, our idea is that let's just, you know, take them both and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you may want to close you that? Yeah, okay, well, uh, thank you everybody. Thank you especially Alana for this wonderful talk. And we'll see you at the next Bioinfo for Women session. Thank you very much. So Eduardo and Alana, you have another link now to have mm -hmm. the continuation of the discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you everyone, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, goodbye.